All right, folks, let's get moving. Y'all doing okay? Don't forget the exam is on Thursday, okay? So that exam, if I understand right, covers chapters 2 and 3. Okay, so there's a lot of material on the exam. It'll be 40 to 50 questions. Uh, there'll be some simple calculations like we did, like with the conservation of energy stuff. But it's going to be very simple. You'll be able to do it very round numbers, very just simple multiplication, okay? Uh, but most of it's going to be more, what's the word, conceptual, informational type things. I'd recommend that you read your book, go through the notes. Um, that's a good way to prepare for the exam, all right? We also had, what, two quizzes, three quizzes maybe in those times? Uh, so you might want to look back at those quizzes. I might even reuse some of those questions, okay? I will post those. Not all of those are posted, but I will post them online. Let me make a note to myself. Y'all have any questions about the exam? Any questions? Y'all know how to prepare for it? Study. <laughs> No questions? It's going to be multiple choice. Please bring a Scantron and a pencil, of course. Um, you won't need a calculator, so that, that won't be necessary. All right. Um, let's see, where did we leave off? Today we're going to finish up Chapter 3. Yeah, let's see, we left off with metabolism. Remember, metabolism was just uh, a measure of your rate of energy usage in your body. So how quickly does your body use up energy? And as we said, different people have different rates of metabolism. Like some people have very low rates of metabolism, so their bodies just walking around just don't use that much energy or just sitting around doesn't use much energy. But then other people have very high rates of metabolism. Um, and that's largely, as I understand it, genetic, but it's also affected by... Um, just sort of how your body is made up. So let me find out where we were here. Let's see, total metabolic rate. We talked about that. Sorry, give me just a moment here. Okay, so within the metabolic rate, we have a couple different kinds, or a couple different uh, types of metabolic rate. The first is the basal metabolic rate, or the BMR. I think y'all have seen all this before, right, in some of your other classes, probably in greater detail. Is that correct, many of you? Yeah, okay, good. So hopefully a lot of this is reviewed for you. But it'll still be on the test on Thursday. Uh, basal metabolic rate, or BMR. Short. Uh, basal metabolic rate is the uh, the rate at which the body converts energy into thermal energy. While you're doing what? While you're resting, right. So this is basically the energy that's required to live, basically. That, that your body, all the basic functions that it does, um, it's the energy required to live. So a typically, typical person might have a BMR of about 65 calories per hour. All right. So roughly how many calories would that person use in, in a 24-hour period? Would they use 100 calories? Would they use 1,600 calories? Would they use 3,000 calories? 
or would they use 1,000 calories? And we'll take this as A, B, C, and D. A person, typical person with a BMR of 65 calories per hour would use how many calories in a particular day? Right? Would they use 100 calories, 1,600, 3,000, or 1,000? Actually, these are big C calories. In a 24-hour period, how many would they use? Oh, actually, no, I'm sorry. These aren't uh, big. These are actually... Uh, no, it's right. Never mind. I'm sorry. Big C calories. All right, I'll give you about 10 more seconds. To 115. Five seconds. Okay, very good. So just 24 times 65 is roughly 1,600. Um, and so that's the, the number of calories that you need just to sort of, if you were to sit around all day, that's the number of calories that you'd need. And, you know, typically they recommend, what, how many calories per day? 2,000, around 2,000 for a sort of normal active person. So most of those calories are not going to running up and down the football field, right? Most of those calories are just going into living, 1,600 out of 2,000. That's practically all of what you eat in a day. Um, now, as I said, different people will have different BMRs and younger people. Can I go down from here? Younger people have a higher BMR. Why do younger people have a higher BMR? Like kids, for example? Because they're more active and then they're also doing what? They're getting bigger, right? So a lot of energy goes into just getting bigger. So they have a higher BMR because they're more active and then also because they're growing, right? Uh, also, tall, thin people have a high BMR. I mean, that's part of the reason that they're thin, right? Because they have a high, or a, a very high metabolic rate, a high BMR. But there's another reason that's actually more causal, that tall, thin people have a higher BMR because of the surface area, right? So they, their body has to generate a lot of heat because they have a larger surface area. So tall, thin people have a higher surface area or have a bigger surface area. So it requires a lot of energy just to keep their body heated. And so that causes for a higher BMR, uh, just to to maintain their their uh, their temperature, their core temperature. All right. Now, apart from the basal metabolic rate, we have something else called the TMR. What does the T stand for? No. The total meta total metabolic rate. And this accounts not just living, but also everything else that you do. So the total metabolic rate is the total energy, <coughs> hence the name total, uh, to run your body, including the activities that you engage in. So whatever it is that you do playing basketball, or just walking around, whatever. All right? So it's the total energy to run your body, the total metabolic rate. 
Uh, so your BMR, you know, we found that the BMR in the previous for a typical person in a day, the basal metabolic rate required about 1,600 calories. What was that? What was that? Was that one of y'all? Oh, it's okay. That's okay. Is it, what's her name? The iPhone lady? Siri? Yeah, is it Siri? It's okay, Tal, you don't have to do anything about it. It's okay. All right, so the BMR requires, say, 1,600 calories. The TMR, oh, oh wait, no. Nope. The TMR could be quite a bit more than that, depending upon the level of activity that you do. It could be, you know, anywhere up to 2,500 calories or even more, depending upon what kind of activities you're engaged in. All right. I have a little clip. This is from the Nutrition Diva. Y'all ever listen to this? I know it sounds kind of corny, but it's actually quite good. Y'all ever listen to the Nutrition Diva podcast? It's on the, uh, gosh, what's it, the Quick and Dirty Tips series. Uh, it's on iTunes. It's fairly interesting. As, you know, athletic training majors, I think I might like it. But this is uh, from the Nutrition Diva, and it's just talking about calorie consumption and how many calories you should consume in a day. It's just a few minutes long. That's a pretty good podcast if y'all want to go check it out. You can pick it up on your iPod or your iPhone or whatever on iTunes. Um, and I think it comes out every day. It talks a lot of stuff about nutrition and, and the things that we eat and how that affects our body. Um, let's see. So where were we? Oh, we've, uh, this is sort of an aside, but we took our dog to the vet. We have a golden doodle. Y'all know what a golden doodle is? It's a golden retriever poodle mix. And he's big. He's like 110 pounds. And so the vet told us that he needed to lose some weight because he's getting older. And as we get older, you know, our metabolism drops and it's easier for us to gain weight. Uh, and Jasper is, he's pushing nine now. So he's getting older. And the vet told us to cut his food in half. So we cut his food in half. So he went from eating like this much down to this much. And he's lost a lot of weight. And the vet told us that even though Jasper, like when we cut his food in half, he looked very, what's the right word, upset like very whiny about food because he'd eat his food and then he'd come see my boy who always feeds him and just sit there right next to him the entire morning. Uh, but our vet told us that dogs don't worry about anything. So we're, we're remembering that, that dogs don't worry and they're not concerned, but he seems awfully hungry. All right. Um, but that's easy with a dog, right, because we control their diet completely. But obviously as people, you know, our diets are much more complex than a dog. All right. Let's move on to temperature. Heat and the body temperature. We think Jasper has lost about 10 pounds. We're not sure, which is good. It's sort of hard to tell because, you know, a, a golden doodle gets really fluffy every few months or so, and then we get him shaved off. And so right now, like, he's putting on more hair. So he looks big, but we think that underneath the hair, he's a slim and fit young man. All right, heat and body temperature. Um, our body temperature is very regular, and that's unlike other, I mean, it's like other warm-blooded creatures, but unlike many creatures in, in the Earth. Uh, this regularity of temperature, y'all know what it's called? Homeostasis, yeah, it's called homeostasis. Uh, I don't know the roots of the word. There's no C there. But stasis, I know, is similar to stable. Homeo, I don't know what that means. But anyway, homeostasis is uh, the body's temperature is very regular. And our core temperature, our, the temperature of our skin can change quite a lot, right? Like you can touch somebody with your hands and, oh, you have cold hands. But the core temperature doesn't change hardly at all. The core temperature, that's the temperature of our organs and the temperature of our body, like, you know, a few centimeters below our skin. The core temperature... only changes slightly in a couple of cases.
What are the couple of cases? What are some cases where your core temperature can change? Okay, if you're sick with illness, or what else? And exercise, right. So your core temperature can change with illness and exercise. Uh, if you have a fever, somebody said, or if you're exercising vigorously. Um, and the outer portions of the body, these can change a lot with, uh, can vary widely, or can change a lot. And the outer portions of the body, that just includes, for example, or includes the skin. All right, you can have cold fingers, but that doesn't mean that you have a cold core temperature. Or you can be really hot on your forehead, but that doesn't mean that you have a fever necessarily. All right, so the outer portions can change a lot based on the environment that you're in or what you're doing. All right, uh, heat is lost, lost through the skin in a few different ways. In fact, all the different ways that we talked about. So we have heat loss uh, through the skin. And you need to know these three different ways of heat loss. Uh, we've already talked about them, but they're conduction. What was the other one? Convection and radiation, right. So we have three different means, uh, conduction, convection, and radiation. Hey, Julia. Conduction, convection. And radiation. Now, yeah, evaporation. Right. I was about to say this includes evaporation. Evaporation. We'll talk about this in just a bit. And that, of course, that is a big means of heat loss through the skin that we regulate our temperatures through evaporation or by sweating. Uh, evaporation includes a combination of these two, conduction and convection. We'll talk about that in a bit. Because you get water droplets that form on your skin, and they conduct heat away from your body. And then as the air currents come through, and they, they change, they cause it to evaporate. So that's a form of convection. So you get air currents that come around your arm, and that will cause that sweat to evaporate and carrying immense amounts of energy away, which goes back to our, our discussion about the latent heat this would be the latent heat of vaporization, that when you change phases of a material, that causes a lot of energy to be carried away. We'll go talk about evaporation in just a bit. Okay, so how these various things occur. Uh, conduction. Typically, the organs are at a higher temperature than the skin. higher temperature than the skin. And so you have conduction that will occur between the organs and the skin. So let me show you a little picture. This is going to be a person. Uh, not a very good person. You get the idea. He has very large feet, this person. Okay, you get it? All right, so he has organs. Is his heart, is his lungs, whatever. These are all very hot in comparison to the skin. And so you get this heat flow that will flow from the organs out to the skin. That's a means of conduction. And we talked about conduction and how the rate of conduction, that Q over T, is dependent upon your temperature, your temperature differential. It was dependent on some other things, like right, the thermal conductivity, the area, the length. Uh, but it's also dependent upon the difference in temperature. So if I have 98.6 here, and I have 97 or whatever, then I'm going to have a net flow of energy away from the center of the body. I'll have heat flow from the hot part to the cold part. So that's conduction, for example, from the organs to the skin. Uh, convection. Drawing this reminds me of, can I take a little aside for just a second? This is not related to the core. You don't need to write this down. But for years, my son and my, my little daughter, I've convince them that I'm not ticklish. And the way I do this is they'll come up and they'll try to tickle me and I'll just grin and bear it. Right? And they'll tickle me and I'm like, I'm not ticklish. 
And so like they've, my boy is almost nine, and he, he's convinced that I'm not ticklish. But this weekend, we were just messing around. Oh, and so uh, my wife, on the other hand, she doesn't do that. And so they're always tickling her. And every once in a while, they'll come and try me just to see if it stains. And I'm like, I'm not even ticklish. It doesn't even do anything. Uh, but this weekend, my boy caught me off guard or whatever, and he tickled me. And I let out a big old laugh because I just wasn't prepared for it. And he stopped. You are ticklish. And then, like, the entire day on Saturday, he was just trying to tickle. Tickle, tickle, tickle. So, I don't know, I have to sort of reacquire that, that facade of not being ticklish in some way. All right, so conduction. Convection. Don't write that down. That was not related in any way. Just reminded me drawing this body. Uh, convection. And this occurs in the body when cool air comes into contact. With this with the warm skin. The cool air comes into contact with a warm skin. The skin will warm the air then. And then the air is replaced with more cool air. And the warm air is replaced with cool air. So it doesn't just feel good to sit in front of a fan. It actually does cool your body a lot because of this convection. Because you're continually replenishing the warm air around your body that's being heated by your body with cool air. So that's an example of convection and how it occurs around the body. Um, so, like for example, we sleep with a ceiling fan on because I sleep really hot. My wife, on the other hand, sleeps really cold. But we sleep with a ceiling fan because it replaces the air above the bed with cooler air. And that does quite a bit to cool off the general body around you, right? Convection. Radiation. Uh, and warm objects, as we talked about, emit infrared radiation. You probably learned your electromagnetic spectrum back in gosh, grade school, maybe. But uh, you might have seen it in chemistry, taking chemistry. But the electromagnetic spectrum includes all of light. So the visible light, the light that we see, is just a small portion of that electromagnetic spectrum. It goes all the way out to gamma rays and x-rays on one end of high energy. And then on the other end, it goes out to radio waves. We'll deal with that when we get into light in a later chapter. But uh, we emit in the infrared, all right, the visible light that you see coming off of me is merely a reflection from those lights to me. But you, if, I, if you turned all the lights off, you would actually be able to see all of us emitting infrared radiation. If we had a special camera, if we had special infrared eyes like Arnold Schwarzenegger in The Predator. Well, no, he didn't have infrared eyes. The Predator had infrared eyes, right? Have you all seen The Predator? Yeah, okay. So they have infrared eyes. Uh, you can get infrared cameras. And I have a little clip here uh, that just shows these two guys messing around with a infrared. As we, we had said this before, but radiation is actually quite a big part of, uh, of their energy loss. Do you remember what is our wattage as infrared? It's a, we're basically like 100 watt bulbs walking around, but not emitting in the visible, but emitting in the infrared. So we lose quite a bit of energy to radiation. Um, and then finally, I'm, it's not really one of the three means of of uh, energy transfer, but I'm going to list it here. I'll, I'm not going to number it, but evaporation also plays a big part. I think I'll address this in just a little bit. Evaporation through sweating. Let me go ahead and write this here. It might come up again. I'm not sure. Uh, through sweating. And this is energy loss. by the uh, conversion of water from liquid to gas or vapor. Okay, 
if you recall, this we calculated this. Uh, it was the mass of the liquid times the latent heat. In this particular case, it would be the latent heat of vaporization. This should be the one right here. Okay. Um, now, the way these break down, typically, go down to the next page. Let me draw this back up. All right. Typically, conduction and convection. And as far as our energy loss of the human body, conduction and convection. These make up about 20% of our total energy loss, our heat loss to our surroundings. Uh, radiation makes up a whopping 50%. And then evaporation through sweating makes up the remainder or about 30%. And as I said before, typically this radiation accounts for about 100 watts of heat. That's 100 joules per second coming off your body uh, in the form of heat. All right. Um, you can affect these by a number of different things, a number of different ways, just changing your physical scenario. You can uh, affect heat loss. Uh, in a number of ways. So, like for example, we do this a lot in our house because in the summertime we typically keep our air conditioner very high just to save money and we think it's better for you. So we'll keep our AC at around 80 or 82 during the day, which is kind of warm, right, in a house. But it, you can do some things in the summertime, especially around Louisiana, to help maintain this body temperature. One thing is you can take cold showers. You know, taking a hot shower in the morning really elevates your body temperature a lot. And so if you take cold or cool showers in the morning, that helps to, to lower the amount of heat that you lose, not just when you're taking the shower, but actually throughout the day. You can take cold or cool showers. You can do what else around here? I'm from Mississippi. We do this a lot in Mississippi. You drink what? Huh? You drink cold drinks, right? You drink, you sit around and you drink your big old cup of cold sweet tea or whatever. So. You drink a uh, cold drink, water typically, all right, not not alcohol because that dehydrates you. Um, so you have cold drink, and then you can also have loose clothing. This helps to uh, this aids in convection when you have loose clothing. In fact, have you ever seen the seersucker shirts? Seersucker shirts, they're like the shirts that are kind of bumpy. Yeah, those are seersucker material. Those are actually uh, first used out in Asia or in India where it's very, very hot uh, in their hottest parts of the year. And the reason is, is because it aids in convection because since the material isn't flat, it doesn't stick to your skin, it has little ridges in it. And so you get more airflow over your skin. And then they have long sleeve shirts to protect them from the sun. But it's a seersucker type material which aids in convection. All right, so there are a number of different ways to affect heat loss. Uh, likewise, in the winter time, you can you know take hot showers in the morning to keep you warm. You can drink hot drinks, and then you can have insulated layers. And that basically, as we talked about the the conduction, the rate of conduction, it increases that value d, which decreases the rate of conduction. I'll write that in just a second because we'll readdress that. Okay. Um, Okay, so how does the body regulate its temperature? There are a number of different ways. The body really is quite fascinating, is it not? Like there are a lot of systems in the body that are just very complex and they're all sort of interconnected. So how does the body regulate its own temperature? Um, 
the brain, the hypothalamus, thalamus? Am I saying that correctly? The hypothalamus. region of the brain. Can increase or decrease the amount of heat generated. Based on information it receives from receptors around the body. So basically you have these tiny little thermostats all over your body or at certain points in the body as I understand it. And when a certain part of your body gets overheated, it sends a signal to your brain. And then it can do a variety of things in order to uh, either cool off or heat up that portion of the body. And it does this in a couple different ways. It can, uh, the blood vessels in the skin can contract. They actually get smaller. Would this cause you to heat up or cool off? If your blood vessel is contracted, it's okay. If your blood vessel is contracted, would that be less or be heating up or cooling off? It'd be cool off because you would have less blood flow to the skin, right? So this would be less blood flow. Well, is that right? Yeah, so, okay. Okay, yeah, so less blood flow means that less blood is going to the skin, so it's maintaining your core temperature better. Okay. Yeah, so less blood flow means less heat loss. Let's say that. Less heat loss through the skin. Thank you for correcting me. All right, so the blood vessels on the skin can, can contract. Uh, you can have shivering. And that's going to produce heat. It's like doing jumping jacks, right? This can cause your temperature to heat up, like uncontrollable shivering. Uh, third, you can have, they can have, the brain can actually release chemicals. And these chemicals would to increase your BMR. Remember one of the ways that the nutrition diva, I don't know her name, but the nutrition diva, she said that one way to increase the number of calories that you burn is to do what? Right, to turn your thermostat down. And when you turn your thermostat down, your, your body basically has to do more work in order to maintain its temperature. And uh, it can increase actually your, your basal metabolic rate. I have a little clip here just about the, uh, the brain and how it does this. It's not very long. Wedding. All right. Any question about this? I think y'all probably seen a lot of this, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good then. All right. I move down from here. All right. Just a few more things, and then we'll wrap up this chapter. Um, there are a couple of uh, results from your body not regulating its temperature. One of these is called hyperthermia. And this just means that your temperature of your body is what? Too low or too high? Right. So that means that your temperature is too high. Uh, this can result from a fever. For example, uh, where your, temperature, your core body temperature might rise, you know, a couple degrees, four or five degrees maybe even. Um, when you get a fever, actually, do you know what happens within your body? Like why is it that you're getting a fever? Or what does that cause to happen in your body? 
Yeah, it, it's, your body is generating white blood cells, which helps to fight infection. So it's good to get a fever when you're sick. So when you get a fever, uh, your body produces white blood cells, or it produces extra white blood cells. I know, like in our family, when I get sick, I usually produce, I usually get a fever, and sometimes I'll get a really high fever, like 102 or 103 or whatever. But then I have it for like four hours, and then I'm done, like I'm completely well. But my wife, for example, sometimes she might get a fever, or she might get a really low fever, uh, but usually she doesn't at all, and she's usually just like sick for like a week or whatever, even if it's something that's very similar, like it's something that we've both gotten. I'm not a doctor, but I think that's why, because I get a fever and she doesn't. And that's true with our kids, too, right? Kids get fevers really readily, but then they get over things really quickly, too. So our body has this sort of natural defense that's based on our temperature. Uh, you can also have heat stroke. And in heat stroke, your body loses the ability to cool itself. All right, so you can no longer sweat. You just don't have these means to, to cool yourself when you have heat stroke. And that can be very dangerous, dangerous obviously, because, uh, because your body can just heat up more and more and more. All right. The other is hypothermia. And this is when your temperature is what? Right, so when you have a temp that's too low, And I'll just leave it there. All right, so hyperthermia and hypothermia. So make sure you know the definition of those and what, what they uh, result in, right, as in as far as for hyperthermia. All right, just one more topic here. Can I go down to the next page? I'll wait just a second. Why doesn't a gingerbread wear shorts? Because he has crummy legs. All right. Y'all hang on. We just have a little bit longer. You might even get out a little early. Okay? Um, right. Why does a gingerbread not wear shorts? Because he has crummy legs. Uh -huh. All right. Specific heat and the thermal conductivity of the body. They do a, a calculation that's similar to this. Um, let's say that we have a, consider that we have a feverish person. With a very high fever, say 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and what would you do with such a person in order to bring their body temperature down quickly? Right, you could put them in a tub of water. So you place them in a tub of water, cool water. To lower their body temperature. Um, and it's a fairly simple calculation in order to figure out how much energy must leave the body and then how quickly it will when you put them into that that tub of water to figure out how quickly, how long they need to stay in the tub in order to uh, to see a decrease in their temperature. The first thing is, we'll go return back to our calorimetry equation. Q is equal to mc delta t. All right. Um, let's say that the mass of our person, typical person, has a mass of how many kilograms? Yeah, about 70 kilograms. That's a typical person. So about 70 kilograms. Uh, the specific heat of a person, you all know this? Yeah, it's 0.84. Very good. So it's 0.8. Uh, the specific heat of a person is a little bit less than that of water, uh, and it's going to be 0.84 uh, 
That's uh, kilocalories. Those are the big C calories per kilogram degree Celsius. And we want to change our body temperature. 104 degrees Fahrenheit actually is about 40 degrees Celsius. And we want to return back to our normal temperature. Uh, what's our normal temperature going to be? 37 degrees Celsius. You should know for the test next time those basic temperatures. Remember, there were a couple temperatures that I said you should just know. One of which was the uh, room temperature in Celsius centigrade. What is that? Okay, 70 Fahrenheit, but what is it in Celsius? About 20 degrees Celsius. And then also the body temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. Those are just two numbers that are good to have rattling around in your head uh, when you're talking with somebody who's using the Celsius system. All right, so in this way we can figure out what is our, our, the amount of heat that would be required for this person to lose in order to return back to their normal temperature. Uh, so 176, yeah. So they need to lose 176 kilocalories in order to return back to their, their normal bodily temperature. Or if you want to think about this in terms of joules, uh, that's 740,000 joules. All right, 740,000 joules. I just converted that. Don't worry, you don't need to know how to convert kilocalories to joules, but it is a simple conversion because they're both energy units. Um, all right, now this occurs through conduction. When you put this person into the tub, this transfer of energy occurs through conduction. And so we can return back to our conduction equation. That is Q over T equals K. Remember, K was our thermal conductivity. Uh, so, for example, metal has a much higher thermal conductivity than, say, wood or fiberglass. It's how quickly does it transfer that thermal energy. Uh, a is the area. Delta T is our difference in temperature. And then D is the distance. In this case, the distance would be the distance from the, the core of our body to the outer part of the skin. So it would be, you know, a centimeter or two through the skin. Uh, for the body, let's just sort of estimate some of these things. For the body, K is equal to 0.2 joules, 0 0.2 joules per millisecond. No, that, that's not right. It's just 0.2 joules per second. I'm sorry. I had a mistake in my notes. Sorry. It's 0.2 joules per second. So every second we lose two tenths of a joule. So if you're in this, in this, uh, through, from the, the core of your body to the surface of your skin, through your skin. Uh, what is the area of a, of your body, roughly? About what the area of your body is? Okay, you've been reading ahead, right? Or do you just know that? Okay. You've read it. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, the area of your body is about 1.8 square meters, or about 2 square meters. I'll take it at 1.8. Right, so that's your area. And then, um, our difference in temperature, our delta T, this is going to be the difference in temperature between you and the water. So that's going to be, let's say you're at a, uh, what do we say, 40 degrees minus the temperature of the water. And the temperature of the water is, say, at room temperature, so that's at about 20 degrees Celsius. So our difference in temperature between you and the water is going to be about 20 degrees Celsius. Because your fever is at 40 degrees, the water is at room temperature about 20 degrees, and so our difference is going to be 20 degrees Celsius. And then finally, uh, D is about one centimeter. This is the, roughly the height or the depth of your skin. That heat is traveling through your skin. And this is equivalent to one hundredth of a meter or 0 0.01 meters. All right, so we can put all these things in and we can figure out what is our rate of energy transfer. And it turns out, let's see, it's 0.2 times 1.8 meters squared times 20 degrees Celsius divided by D, which is 0.01. Turns out that this is about 720 joules per second. Like 720 joules per second.
You could see something like this on the test on Thursday, where I ask you what is the rate of energy conduction. But I would give you very simple numbers. So they would all be whole numbers, and you'd be able to do it just on paper, because we're not going to have calculators on the test. All right? But they would be just whole numbers that you could do very simply. If you have trouble with that, if you're, if you're worried about that, please come see me. I can help you. I'll show you some examples. All right? It would be like 4 over 2 or something crazy like that. OK? You will be OK with that? All right. Let's look now at a. Uh, oh, so uh, if we needed to re remove 740,000 joules, which is what we needed, so in order to change the body's temperature, we need to remove 740,000 joules. If we're going at 720 joules per second, then that's going to take approximately 1,000 seconds. In 1,000 seconds, we would remove 720,000 joules. So about, about 1,000 seconds, which is equivalent to about 20 minutes. Or you could just check their temperature and see when their temperature has dropped down. That might be easier. Or you could go through this calculation. Either way is fine. OK? All right. They had one last section here. It's really just a paragraph or two on energy imbalance. And then I have a little clip I want to share with you, and then we'll be done. We'll be out a few minutes early. All right, so energy imbalance. Basically, they say that if you use more energy than you consume, then you'll encounter weight loss. And that, that's sort of a, a fact. Now, it's not that simple, obviously. But if you, lose, if you use more energy, Then you consume. Then this leads to weight loss. <laughs> and that can be important for a variety of reasons, whether you're an athlete or whether you're just a person living in the world. All right, so if you use more energy than you consume, uh, that encounters in weight loss. And likewise, if you consume more energy than you use, and that's going to lead to what? Weight gain, right. And those are uh, veritable truths. Those are true. That if you use more energy than you consume, then you'll encounter weight loss. However, there are a lot of different factors that can contribute. So, for example, high-carb diets can lead to weight gain. I'm sure you all know more about this than me. Uh, but basically, the carbs are converted into what? Into fat, right? Yeah, so carbs are converted into fat. All right. I have a little clip here. This is that Nutrition Diva lady again, and she's talking now about high-carb diets versus high-protein diets. All right, and then after that, we'll go. I'll let y'all okay getting out a few minutes early? Yeah. Yes, okay. All right, let me uh, take this down. Can I take this away now? All right. Any other, y'all have any thoughts about the test on Thursday or any last minute questions? Okay. I'd read your book. I'm going to closely follow the book, but read through your notes as well. Some of the questions that I asked in class, you could see those again. Some of the clicker questions that I asked in class. You can see some of the examples that I worked in class. All right.